Welcome to part two of my introduction to the Roman history course, the course on the historical context for the New Testament and the early church. What we're going to do now is kind of a big picture overview of the Roman emperors through the first century and what was going on during each of their reigns, especially as it applies to the church. And I'm also going to mention with each emperor how the imperial cult, or the idea of emperor worship, uh, develops and escalates throughout the first century. Okay, so here we go. You already know that the first emperor of the Roman Empire is Augustus, and he ruled, depending on whether you begin his reign from 31 BC or 27 BC, he ruled obviously on into the Christian era, which is what we call AD, or CE for the Christian era. And so from now on, all the dates will be AD or CE. Okay, so Augustus rules until 14 AD. Now, remember that in Judea, Herod was hated. Nobody liked him. He taxed the people to death. He, he did a lot of building and even tried to uh, restore the temple, but the taxation was just too great, and so everyone hated him, and they hated his sons as well. And in 6 AD, um, his son Archelaus was removed from power, and Judea was reduced in status from a client kingdom to a colony. Judea becomes a colony annexed to Syria. But Galilee remained a client kingdom. And so Galilee continues to be a separate kind of country with its own king. And that was Herod II, or Herod Antipas, the son of Herod I. And so when you read the Gospels and you see that uh, John the Baptizer criticizes a King Herod, and that King Herod has John executed, or you see Jesus meet a King Herod at his trial. Um, that is Herod Antipas, Herod II, King of Galilee. When Augustus became emperor, one of the first things he did was that he got the Senate to declare his great uncle, Julius Caesar, as having been deified at his death. And in fact, there was a comet that went by and Augustus pointed to the comet and said, there he is. That is Uncle Julius becoming a god. The gods have made him one of them upon his death. And so he got the Senate to declare that now Julius Caesar had become a god. Well, what that does is effectively makes Augustus himself a son of a god. And in fact, there was a temple built uh, to, to Julius Caesar. The first one was destroyed, but then another one was built. Uh, and that's the remains of that are still in the forum. Um, but the point is, is that now we have a situation where Augustus can claim to be a son of a god. And this right at the same time when the son of the god was born in Bethlehem. So uh, Augustus died on September 14th in the year 14 AD. Why is the date important? Well, because in Luke chapter 3, Luke tells us that Jesus was baptized and began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. So Tiberius was the next emperor after Augustus. He ruled from 14 to 37 AD, right? So the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius is from September 14th in the year 29 to September 14th in the year 30. That's how they would reckon the 15th year. So Jesus begins his ministry sometime in late 29 or early 30, and based on other evidence in the Gospels, it's probably in, uh, in the first half of the year 30 AD, right? And so that means that if Jesus is born in 5 BC, that he's now 35 years old, right? There's a tradition that Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry, but that's because his ministry began in the year 30 AD and people are assuming he was born in 1 AD. He was not. So he's actually about 
35 years old when he begins. Now, Luke says he's about 30, but Luke is not trying to be precise here. Luke is just saying he's a relatively young man compared to what you'd expect for a, you know, uh, traveling rabbi, right? He's, he's about 30 as opposed to being about 70 or 80. And that's Luke's point. It's, it's surprising how young he is for who he was. So Tiberius became the emperor, not because he was the son of Augustus, uh, but because he was adopted by Augustus. And in Roman law, an adult could adopt another adult as his son. And this is what some of the Roman emperors did. Rather than uh, just leave it to chance to see who would succeed them, if they had no heir, they would adopt the man whom they wanted to be the next emperor. They would adopt that man as their son, and then that person would theoretically be the next emperor. So Augustus uh, chose Tiberius to be the next emperor and adopted him as his son and heir, even though Tiberius was already at least middle-aged by that time. Okay, so Tiberius becomes emperor in the year 14 AD. And Tiberius is actually responsible for building a lot of the roads and a lot of that kind of infrastructure for the Roman Empire. So when you think of Roman roads, uh, think of Tiberius. Uh, But the other thing he did was he gradually took away the power of the Senate. In fact, I think Augustus Augustus had already started this. Augustus had already started down this path of less asking the Senate for permission to do things and more giving them a heads up after having already done it, right? And so in Tiberius's reign, even more so, the Senate is losing its power to control the emperor and say what the emperor can and can't do. And more and more, the Senate is becoming just a rubber stamp that the emperor may feel he needs to get to justify his actions, but he's not really asking for permission anymore. Now, now Tiberius had um, astrologers in his employ, and his astrologers told him that it was getting dangerous for him to be in Rome. And so from about 27 AD or so, he never went to Rome anymore. He stayed away, and he stayed at his uh, villa on the island of Capri. And if you go to the island of Capri, you can see the remains of his villa are still there. Um, Okay, so now Pontius Pilate, remember, is appointed as procurator in Judea in the year 26. And over the time that Pilate was the procurator of Judea, he made several mistakes that got him in trouble with the emperor. And the Sanhedrin would regularly send delegations to Rome to complain about what was going on and to complain about what Pilate was doing. And Pilate was regularly getting in trouble with the emperor. So starting around 32 AD or so, uh, the first, well, the first thing uh, that that Pilate did uh, that was that was wrong was that he marched into Jerusalem with uh, legions bearing the standards of the emperor. Now, what that means is that these standards are banners that have on them a picture of the emperor, an image of the emperor. And so here comes, you know, the colonizing army marching into Jerusalem carrying banners with an image on them of the emperor who, you know, is on the path toward being worshipped. And so um, so the Jewish people kind of freaked out and uh, complained to the emperor. Uh, the next thing Pilate did was he took money out of the temple treasury. He took money from the Jerusalem temple. Uh, now, he used it to build an aqueduct. So he's probably thinking, what? I, I built you an aqueduct. But you don't take money out of the temple treasury. Well, then he went ahead and minted his own coins, and he minted coins, and he he had on the coins the name of the emperor Tiberius, which is normal in a Roman context, Um, but the the emperor's name is as good as an image, and so there were also pagan symbols on the coins, and so again, the Jews complained to Rome. Finally, Pilate decorated the praetorium, remember Herod's old palace in Jerusalem, Uh, Pilate decorated the the main hall of the praetorium by hanging shields around the perimeter of the hall. And these shields also had the emperor's name on them, which again, names as good as an image. And so they complained. And in this case, the emperor actually made Pilate 
take the shields down. There's also a story of a massacre of some Galileans, which is hinted at in the text, and there's evidence of this outside of the Bible too, and so Pilate may have been responsible for that as well. And so all of this means that by the time it comes to Jesus's trial, Pilate already has more than three strikes against him, four or five strikes against him. And so when the when the Sanhedrin, when the, when the uh, Jewish leaders say to Pilate, if you don't have this man executed, then you are no friend of Caesar, right? That's a real threat because Pilate knows he cannot afford any more complaints against him. And so he caves. Now, the best dating for the trial and crucifixion uh, and resurrection of Jesus would be 33 AD. So, um, so that traditional date is probably correct. And again, if you watched part one, you know that the traditional date for the crucifixion is March 25th, although uh, later some Eastern Christians would say April 6th. But at any rate, the event of Jesus's passion, death, and resurrection, uh, we're looking at the year 33. And for the conversion of Paul, probably later in that same year. Paul then meets with Peter and James in Jerusalem in about the year 36. And then in that same year, 36, Pontius Pilate is recalled in disgrace to Rome. But Pilate doesn't arrive in Rome until the year 37. And I'll tell you why that's significant in a minute. But in terms of the escalation of the emperor cult, um, just as Augustus had gotten the Senate to declare Julius Caesar a god after his death, Tiberius did the same with Augustus. And so three days after Augustus' death, uh, the Senate declared him a god and in fact appointed his widow, Livia, as the high priestess of his cult. So now, not only is the dead emperor a god with a temple, but now he has a cult with a priesthood and a high priestess. So Tiberius is uh, also a son of a god, and he started demanding that people call him Lord, and he meant it as a divine title. And again, notice the parallel here. While the emperor in Rome is demanding that people call him Lord, Dominus, at the same time, we have the ministry of Jesus, who is Lord. When Tiberius died in 37, the next emperor would be Caligula. Now, Caligula is a nickname. It's not his actual name. It is actually the Latin word for boot, the military boot that the soldiers wore. And um, as a little kid, he had somebody had made him a pair of military boots his size, and he wore them around everywhere. And so people started calling him Boot. And so that's where the name Caligula comes from. Now, he had been adopted, and then his adoptive father murdered his mother, and then he became the ward of the emperor Tiberius. Now, something I didn't tell you about Tiberius is that he was a sexual predator and a sadist, and he enjoyed torturing people. And so Caligula became, after, by the way, having seen his mother murdered, Caligula became the ward of a man who would abuse him sexually and torture him. And so this kid had no chance. And he is, you know, well known uh, to be one of the craziest emperors Rome had ever had. And on top of everything else, he developed some kind of terminal illness, although we don't really know what that was. And never forget this. You know, the wealthiest people in Rome had indoor plumbing, right? They had water piped into their homes, uh, you know, through pipes. So while most people had to go to the piazza, to the fountain, and get nice, clean, fresh spring water that had just come down from the mountains through the aqueducts, the wealthy people were drinking water that came through lead pipes. And so there's that. Okay, so all of that sort of conspires together and, um, you know, Caligula was crazy. So when Pontius Pilate got recalled 
from Rome by Tiberius in the year 36. It took him a while to get back to Rome. By the time he got there, the year was 37, and Caligula was emperor, and Pilate didn't stand a chance, and he was exiled. There is an interesting tradition. Um, it may be legendary, but, um, but there's a story that when Pilate left Judea to be recalled to Rome, his wife didn't go with him because she had become a Christian. And you remember that bit in the gospel about where his wife comes to him and says, don't have anything to do with this guy, Jesus. I had a dream, right? And so uh, the story is that, that Pontius Pilate's wife became a Christian. Well, anyway, um, Caligula's reign was characterized by a lot of what we might call precautionary executions. In other words, he, he got himself into a vicious cycle of being paranoid about assassination plots, which then led to executing all the people he was paranoid about, which then led to actual assassination plots, which then led to more paranoia, more executions, and the vicious cycle continued. Um, and so he was universally hated. He disrespected the Senate. They disrespected him. He drained the treasury. He persecuted the Jews. And in fact, it was said that by the end of his reign, Caligula had intended to set up a statue of himself in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. He never got the chance, though, because he was assassinated. Now, in terms of the escalation of the emperor cult here, um, the fact that Caligula was putting up statues of himself in temples and intended to do that in the, in the temple in Jerusalem shows that we're now in a, in a place where we're moving from an emperor claiming to be the son of a dead god to an emperor claiming to be a living god. And so we're on that path here. Okay, so Caligula was assassinated in 41, and his successor was going to be his uncle, Claudius. Even though Claudius was older than Caligula, Claudius did not want to be the emperor. And in fact, he had been playing dumb. He had been pretending to be slow or innocent or something, and um, the, nobody thought he could reign as the emperor. And he was doing this in part so that no one would kill him to get him out of the way, because there would be plenty of people who would kill him to remove him as an obstacle to them becoming emperor. So he, he'd been playing dumb all along. But when Caligula was assassinated, the, uh, the Praetorian Guard found Claudius and proclaimed him emperor. And once Claudius was the emperor, he stopped playing dumb and he stepped up to the job. And he adopted a title for himself, the title of Caesar. Now, up until this point, Caesar is a name. It was the name of some of his predecessors. It wasn't his name, but he adopted it as a name, as a title. And so from that time on, Caesar becomes a title for the emperor. Um, and so he is now Claudius Caesar. Claudius is the one that started up the colonization again. He wanted to expand the borders, but right away it becomes a problem because the more you expand the borders, the harder it becomes to protect the borders. And so the, the, the legions, uh, certainly the auxiliary legions, but even some of the Roman le legions are now reduced to having to stay at the borders and function as border police, and some of them never get to come home. And so instead of having these, these occasional great military victories where you can have a triumphal parade and the, the general can parade through the streets of Rome and everyone can proclaim him a hero, well, now the heroes of the Roman people are no longer military heroes, but sports heroes, the gladiators, the jockeys, and the other uh, heroes of the games. Now, I mentioned in part one that uh, there was a history in Rome of kicking people out of the city 
when a group becomes what the Senate might consider a nuisance. And so they kicked out the astrologers at one point, and they kicked out the worshippers of Isis at another point. In 139 BCE, they, uh, they kicked all the Jews out of Rome for proselytizing, for converting people to Judaism. And that set a precedent, because that, was going to, that would become law, and then later it would be applied to Christians. So, in the year 41 AD, Claudius makes a law against Jewish proselytizing. In other words, it becomes illegal to convert to Judaism. Um, But remember that at this time, the Romans don't really know who the Christians are. There are Christians in Rome at this time, but the Romans don't understand that Christianity is separating itself out from Judaism If they hear about Christians at all, they would assume that they're just a sect within Judaism, like Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Christians, who knows? The Romans didn't really know who the Christians are. Peter himself came to Rome in about 42 or maybe 43, 44 AD, somewhere around there. And in 49 AD, Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. And uh, the Roman historian Suetonius records that the reason Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome was that there was some drama um, over somebody named Crestus. Now, you see what's going on here. Crestus could be the name of a slave, and in one translation of it, uh, it it can mean something like useful, like a very useful slave. Um, So that's what Suetonius thinks it means. He thinks that there was some slave named Crestus who was causing drama within the Jewish community, and so they just kicked all the Jews out of Rome. But in reality, this is an argument over Christ going on within the Jewish community, probably with conflict between Jewish Christians and non-Christian Jews. At any rate, Claudius figures that the solution to the problem is to just kick all the Jews out of Rome. And this is why uh, you can read in the New Testament that Paul will meet Priscilla and Aquila, who are from Rome, but they're not in Rome at this time because all the Jews have been kicked out of Rome. Now, in reality, not all the Jews left Rome. Some of them were slaves and couldn't have. Others just laid low and flew under the radar for a while and didn't leave the city. At this time, Judea becomes a client kingdom again, and Claudius makes a man called Agrippa the king of Judea. Now, this Agrippa He's not a Roman, but he takes a Roman name. Agrippa is the name of a prominent Roman family. So he sort of adopts this important Roman name as a way to elevate his own status. And obviously the emperor allows him to do this and because the emperor is making him the king of Judea. Now Agrippa, this is Agrippa I, he's the one who has the apostle James, James the son of Zebedee, executed in the year, uh, again, about 42 to 44 AD. So this is right around the same time that uh, we, we lose track of Peter in the book of Acts. Peter disappears from the book of Acts, and that's when he ends up in Rome, and uh, the apostle James is executed at about the same time. Later in that same year, or, or by the end of 44, Agrippa dies, and Judea reverts again to a Roman province. But by the end of the book of Acts, when you read like in chapters 25 and 26 of Acts, and you see Paul meets an Agrippa, that's actually Agrippa II. That's the son of Agrippa I. Okay, so Paul begins what we refer to as his first missionary journey in about the year 47. Then we have the Jerusalem Council in about 50 AD. And then Paul begins his second missionary journey later that year in 50. And Paul's earliest letters, the letters to the Thessalonians, are written in 51, 52 AD. Paul begins his third missionary journey in 53. Mark's gospel is written in the 50s or at the very latest in the early 60s. Now, when it comes to dating the documents of the New Testament, I'm going to give you the most reasonable dates for the documents of the New Testament. Now, a couple of things about that. First, I am aware that scholars will disagree with me on some of these dates. 
And sometimes that's because they haven't really taken into account the historical context of the of Roman history at the time or the evidence outside of the New Testament in the early church fathers, right? And so um, the dates I'm going to give you are the, the dates that make sense in the big picture. And when you do all the math, everything fits and it all works, right? Uh, sometimes you will hear scholars who want to date things as late as they possibly can, but that is the result of a bias on their part. And um, I will admit up front that my personal bias is to kind of swing the other way and date things as early as possible. When it comes to the Gospels, there are concrete reasons why the Gospels have to be dated the way I'm dating them, and I'll explain those things as I go. So take my word for it. For the moment, Mark's Gospel is written in the 50s of the first century, or at the very latest, in the early 60s. Okay, now we come to Nero. Nero was emperor from 54 to 68 AD. And he was only 16 when he took the throne. So at the beginning of his reign, it was actually his mother who, who ruled and who ran everything and controlled everything. And he didn't like that, and so eventually he murdered his mother. Nero also devalued the coins of Rome. And what that means is, is that if there's a gold coin that's worth its weight in gold, literally, right, what he would do is he would mix the metal so there's less gold in it, but keep the value the same. And this is the origin of things like, you know, money not being worth what it actually claims to be worth and inflation and all of that kind of stuff. So he devalues the, the currency of Rome. And at the same time, he's not paying the, the military their salaries. So they're getting angry. And, um, in general, in terms of the whole vicious cycle of paranoia and precautionary executions, he tried to live up to the uh, example of Caligula. And so by now it became clear that he had to go. And by this time, often it's actually the, the emperor's own bodyguard who will decide when the emperor's reign is over, meaning that they will assassinate him. And, um, and then they will leave it to uh, the military to decide who the next emperor will be. Sometimes that's going to be uh, just simply whoever claims to be emperor first, uh, or if the generals are all out in the field, whoever gets to Rome first. Uh, sometimes it's that simple. Okay, so we're in the reign of Nero, though. Paul is writing more of his letters that we have in the New Testament, and eventually he gets uh, arrested and imprisoned. And he's first imprisoned in Caesarea, in that port city uh, to the north in the Holy Land. From the years 58 to 60, he's imprisoned in Caesarea, and then he's sent to Rome under house arrest. He's in Rome under house arrest in the years 60 to 62-ish. And that's when he writes his prison epistles of, uh, you know, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians. And yes, I am aware that there are scholars who say that Paul didn't actually write some of these letters. But that is a hypothesis based on supposed internal evidence, and they're not taking into account the fact that there is no evidence outside of the documents in the context for any of this. Um, there, is, there, there were no church fathers who thought that Paul didn't write the prison epistles or even the pastoral epistles. So we are going on the assumption that the church fathers were in a better position to know because they lived a lot closer in time. And we're going to go on the assumption that, yes, Paul did write these letters. Okay, now, James, uh, the other James, is now the bishop of Jerusalem, and he was martyred in 62. And, uh, and Paul is in prison. Paul was apparently released from prison for a while, um, and then he uh, at some point wrote the pastoral epistles, and then he was um, re-arrested and thrown in the dungeon, uh, so no longer house arrest, but now actual uh, in the dungeon awaiting execution. Peter also thrown in the dungeon. Now, in the year 64 AD, 
is the Great Fire of Rome. It started on the 18th of July in 64. And the fire, they, they couldn't put it out completely for like a week. And Roman writers like Tacitus and Suetonius mention that as a result of this, well, two things. First of all, everybody suspected that Nero had set the fire because he had on his desk the plans for a new palace that was meant to go right in the spot where the land was cleared by the fire. So everybody knew that Nero had set the fire to clear the land for his new palace. But as the Roman historians record, he needed a scapegoat. And so by now, the Romans know who the Christians are, and they became the scapegoat. They were blamed for the fire. And so uh, starting at this point, this is the first real intentional persecution of Christians by the Roman government. It's pretty much limited to the city of Rome, but Christians, just by admitting they're Christians, are charged with the crime of arson um, and, you know, the equivalent of what we would call terrorism, and uh, they were executed for that crime. Uh, now, for the most part, the Christians would have been executed in a place called the Circus of Nero. A circus is an oval horse race track where they had horse races, but they also had other things, uh, exactly the kinds of things you'd expect to see at a circus, animal acts, jugglers, tumblers, all of that kind of stuff, and also public executions. So this particular circus, called Nero's Circus, it was actually... Uh, the building of it was begun by Caligula, but it was finished by Nero. So it's called Nero's Circus. This particular circus was built on a hill called the Vatican Hill. And this is where the apostle Peter was executed. He was crucified upside down in the circus of Nero, and he was buried in a uh, necropolis or in a, in, in a cemetery right nearby on the other side of the wall outside the bleachers of the circus. And we know where his tomb is. We have always known where his tomb is because it's always been visited by pilgrims. His tomb, to this day, is directly underneath the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican because the Vatican is named after the Vatican Hill, which was already called the Vatican Hill before Christianity ever came on the scene. And so what happened was is when they eventually got around to building St. Peter's Basilica, and this is the second one on that site, they built it intentionally directly over the tomb of St. Peter. St. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, he got the quick and painless death of beheading, and he was executed somewhere else uh, in another part of the city at a place called the Three Fountains. And there's a tradition that says that when they cut off his head. His head bounced three times, and uh, that at each of the points where his head hit the ground, uh, a, a spring bubbled up, a fountain. So it's three fountains. Now, in reality, there are Roman records that describe the three fountains from before this time. So it's a legend, but you can go there today, and you can see the place, three fountains, where St. Paul was executed, and there's a church build, built around the, the streams. The point is that then Paul was buried in another place on the Ostian Road, the road to Ostia, and where Paul's tomb is, is where they built the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls. And so you can go there to this day, and again, St. Paul's tomb is right there. Now, here's a, a really important point. Have you noticed that the book of Acts does not include the great fire of Rome in 64, and the deaths, the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. Why is that? There is only one conceivable reason why the book of Acts does not include the martyrdoms of the two most important apostles, Peter and Paul. The only possible reason why the book of Acts does not include the deaths of Peter and Paul is because they hadn't happened yet when it was written. That means that the book of Acts was written by the mid-60s in the first century. And Acts was written after Luke, so Luke had to be written before that. 
and Mark had to be written before that. And so this is the hard evidence that I was talking about earlier uh, for the dating of the Gospels that I'm talking about. Mark has to be written in the 50s or at the latest in the early 60s because Luke read Mark to write his own Gospel. And Luke has to be written before Luke wrote Acts. And Acts has to be written before the deaths of Peter and Paul. I'll talk about Matthew and John in a bit, but you get the idea. Okay, so now Peter and Paul have both been martyred and buried in the city of Rome in the uh, somewhere around the mid-60s. In the year 66, war breaks out in Judea, and this is the, uh, the, the Jewish war against the Romans, and that uh, that faction, that political party that's a sort of uh, quasi-military group called the Zealots, they were born out of the rebellion over Quirinius's census. They now rebel and are conducting guerrilla warfare against the Roman legions in Judea, and it, it comes to full-on war in the year 66. And um, that war lasted until 70, well, it lasted longer, but in, in the year 70, that's when Jerusalem was sacked and the temple was destroyed. And uh, war went on a little bit longer. I think Masada fell in 73, right? But the point is, if you do the math, those of you who maybe have read the book of Revelation, if you do the math, um, that war from 66 to 70 lasted three and a half years. And I'm actually not saying that the book of Revelation predicted the war. I'm saying that John wrote the book of Revelation after the war and is looking back on it, describing it in symbolic language. If you want more on that, you can check out my book, The Wedding of the Lamb, which is all about the book of Revelation. Okay, well, in the year 68, the Senate uh, sentenced the emperor to death, um, but he didn't wait for them to carry out that order. He committed suicide. And Nero's suicide set off a year of civil war with a succession of four emperors in one year. Uh, so within, within that year 68 um, to the beginning of 69, we have Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and then Vespasian. And uh, I'm going to talk about Vespasian in a second. But in terms of the escalation of the emperor cult, by the time of Nero, Nero considers himself, at least, a full-on living god. And he had a statue built, a statue of himself uh, in the image of the sun god, a golden statue, something like four stories high. And people referred to this statue as the Colossus, which, you know, is just a word that means the really huge thing. And um, the reason why the Colosseum will be called the Colosseum is because it's about to be built next to the Colossus. And so that's why the Colosseum is called the Colosseum. In that sense, the word Colosseum means the, uh, the, the place by the really big thing. But notice, so far the Colosseum hasn't been built yet. So while Christians have died in Rome under Nero and at other times, they're not dying in the Colosseum yet. They will. But at this point, they are being executed in the circuses, and uh, especially the circus of Nero, which, again, as I said, is now uh, the site of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. In about the year 69, with all of the drama that was going on in Rome and these, this quick succession of three emperors in a row, boom, 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 there comes a point where as I hinted earlier, uh, it's going to be a race to Rome. Like whatever Roman general can get to Rome first and claim to be emperor is going to be the next emperor. And so the general of the Roman troops uh, laying siege to Jerusalem, this is Vespasian. He leaves the siege to go back to Rome and claim the throne, and he will become the next emperor. Vespasian will be emperor from 69 to 79 AD. Now, when he leaves the front, he leaves his son Titus in charge. And he says to Titus, Titus, whatever you do, don't destroy their temple. Well, Jerusalem is 
uh, is breached and Titus absolutely did destroy the temple. Now, it's interesting because there were no Christians in Jerusalem at this time. The Christians had fled. Remember that passage in the Gospels where Jesus says, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation coming, right, head for the hills. Now, normally, if you see the siege armies of a pagan nation coming to you and you're in Jerusalem, what you do is go inside the city walls and barricade yourself in. And that's what most of the citizens of Jerusalem did. Here come the Roman armies, get inside the wall, close the doors. The Christians remembered what Jesus said. When you see it coming, head for the hills. They got out and they left. And so they weren't there. So, um, so the, the walls are breached in, and the temple is destroyed in the year 70 AD and, um, and Vespasian becomes the next emperor. And uh, during the reign of Vespasian, the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew was probably written in the 70s, maybe in the early 80s, but probably in the 70s. And Matthew has both uh, Mark and Luke in front of him as he's writing his Gospel. Also written about this time is something called the Didache, which is the first Christian document that we have outside of the New Testament. It's extremely important because it's it's almost a companion to the Gospel of Matthew. If you, if you think of it as the first uh, church order manual um, and or, or almost like kind of a book of discipline for the early church. So the Didache is written at about this time also, right? Now Vespasian is the one who started to build the, uh, the Colosseum. He left the statue of Nero up, and so for a while, the Colosseum was next to the Colossus, and that's why it's called the Colosseum. Where do you think he got the money to build the Colosseum? The Colosseum was paid for with the spoils of war in Judea. And so everything these next three emperors do is paid for with the spoils of war in Judea and, you know, the money stolen from the temple treasury and all of that. Um, and so in terms of the escalation of the emperor cult, right? They, people may have hated Nero, but after he's gone, there's still a statue of him as a god. And people may stop calling it Nero, and they may call it the sun god, but you see we're still blurring the lines between emperor and deity. Okay, in, in 79 AD, Vespasian died, and his son Titus, who had destroyed the temple, he became the next emperor. And Titus was emperor from 79 to 81. During his reign, the Colosseum was finished and dedicated in about 80 AD. And again, Christians will die in the Colosseum, but later, a little bit later. When Titus died, his brother uh, set up for him a triumphal arch to commemorate his death. And in the vault of the arch, there's a sculpture of Titus being becoming a god, being brought up into the divine realm by the other gods. And so again, Titus is declared a, a god after his death. Also in the Arch of Titus, in the uh, relief sculptures on the side, is a sculpture of the triumphal procession that came back from Jerusalem with the spoils of war after the war in Judea. And you can clearly see, you can Google it, um, you can clearly see in this parade where they're where they're showing off the spoils of war you can clearly see the menorah from the temple in Jerusalem there's also a square shape that some people have said is the ark of the covenant uh, others say it's the table of showbread but there's there's clearly something square they're carrying back into Rome as well but the point of all this is that you know this is a uh, a tradition that the Romans had when they came back from war victorious they had a parade a triumphal parade where the uh, the heroes of the war would would wear the the laurel wreath crown of victory, their version of the Olympic medal, and they would literally have floats where they would display the spoils of war and also put on display the royal families of the conquered nations in chains to show their subjugation. And often they were released after that, but they had to be humiliated first. And um, so, you know, when you hear that Jesus 
uh, on that first Palm Sunday had a triumphal entry, right? Know that Jesus is intentionally subverting the Roman tradition of the triumphal parade, the victory parade, right? A Roman general rides into the city in triumph on a white horse, a war horse. Jesus rides in on a donkey, an animal of service, right? So he, Jesus is intentionally reversing that. So that's very interesting. Okay. In the year 81, uh, Titus's brother, the other son of Vespasian, becomes emperor. And he's emperor from 81 to 96. By now, emperors just completely ignore the Senate. And these, these uh, Flavian emperors, the Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian, they're not even Roman. They're not even Italian. So they're seen as outsiders. They have no respect for the Senate. Um, and Domitian is famous for building another circus. He built what's called the Circus of Domitian, or sometimes the Stadium of Domitian. Now, if you go to Rome today, it's known as Piazza Navona. It's one of the most popular uh, piazzas to go to and hang out and eat food. And it really is a very circusy atmosphere. You can have your caricature drawn. You can buy art. You, you know, people are selling trinkets and souvenirs and flowers. And, um, and it's a very festive atmosphere, except it's holy ground because Christians died there. And it was once a circus where they held public executions. And you can see that because the, the, the piazza uh, or, or square is not square. It's shaped like an oval. And because, because the piazza, Piazza Navona, is built on the foundation of the circus of Domitian. Domitian renewed and enforced the ban on conversion to Judaism. And he also picked up on something that had started earlier, which was to demand pagan sacrifices, that is, sacrifices to the gods who were supposed to protect Rome, for anyone who was suspected of being unpatriotic. So the pagan sacrifice becomes a test of patriotism, and anyone who is suspected of a lack of patriotism could be commanded to make a pagan sacrifice to show their loyalty to the emperor. You can already see here the blurring between patriotism and religious devotion, between citizenship and membership in some cult. This is something that had always existed. And um, when you think about what's coming in terms of what Constantine is going to do in terms of legalizing Christianity, uh, there is a myth out there that Constantine created a union of church and state that later had to be separated. And that unfortunately, is actually the opposite of the truth. Constantine actually would one day create or invent the separation of church and state so that he could institute religious freedom. It is not Constantine who made Christianity the, the official religion of the Roman Empire. All he did was legalize Christianity, and he did it in the context of giving religious freedom to everyone, right? Okay, so the point of that is that before the time of Constantine, religion and government were always intertwined. Just look at the Old Testament, the way in which uh, the people of Israel were originally not supposed to have a king because God was their king, right? And so uh, religion and government were always intertwined. In, in every human culture before the emperor Constantine, religion and government were together. And so what you get in the Roman Empire before Constantine, when Christianity is still illegal, what you get is that the accusation that people refuse to worship the gods who are supposed to protect Rome, well, that is an act of treason. That is being unpatriotic. And so we start to see in Roman documents the charge of atheism applied to people who are considered unpatriotic. And in the 90s, Domitian will renew persecution against the Christians, and he will even have members of his own family executed on the charge of the crime of atheism. And basically, atheism here means you don't worship the right gods. Uh, they're, of course, they're not really atheists. They're Christians and Jews 
But the point is, they're not worshiping the Roman gods, the gods the emperor wants them to worship, and so that's considered antisocial behavior and sedition against the, uh, the, the throne. And so, by now, we don't even need the charge of arson to execute Christians. By now, no crime other than the name of Christian is needed because to admit that you are a Christian is to basically admit to the capital offense of atheism. Okay, so in this context, when persecution is being renewed by the Emperor Domitian, we have two documents that are written uh, around the same time. One is a a letter called First Clement. It's a letter by Bishop Clement of Rome written to the Christians in Corinth. And that is our second of our early Christian documents that aren't in the New Testament. The other document is the Book of Revelation, written in the year 95 AD. And interestingly, although there's some debate over this, the Book of Revelation is the one book in the New Testament that we can really date with some precision because of what was going on in the in the context, right? The year 95 is about the only time when you get a window between uh, when, when Domitian started up the persecution again, and then he dies in 96, and the next emperor uh, doesn't really persecute as much, and so it's right in this window of time. It's got to be written in the year 95. And, and, and by the way, if you were to take a coin from this time in the Roman Empire, a Roman coin, And if you were to look at that coin and look at what is inscribed on the coin, the names and titles of the Emperor Domitian, and if you were to take, you have to know the abbreviations for some of the imperial titles, but if you were to take it as it was written on the coin and turn those Greek letters into numbers, guess what it adds up to? 666. Of course it does. So when John writes the book of Revelation and he says, the number is a man's name, that man is the emperor at the time, Domitian. Well, Domitian was assassinated in the year 96 and the plot was led by his wife. And after he was assassinated, his memory was condemned, uh, which is actually an official act by the Senate Uh, damnatio memoriae, the damnation of one's memory. And what that means is then somebody goes out and chisels his name off all the monuments. And you can even see examples of this still to this day in Rome where his name is chiseled off the monuments. Now, Domitian is interesting because in terms of the escalation of divine claims by these emperors, Domitian had demanded that people call him, in Latin, Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. And once again, notice the parallel, because just while Domitian was demanding that people call him Lord and God, John writes his gospel, which tells us that Thomas, upon seeing the risen Christ, said, my Lord and my God. So while the real Lord and God, right, is being uh, written about in the gospel of John, here uh, Domitian is demanding to be called Lord and God. So that brings us pretty much up to the end of the first century almost and uh, the end of the New Testament period. Okay, thanks for hanging out with me uh, for almost an hour here in part two of our introduction to Christianity and culture in the early church. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the Original Church Community on Locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the Original Church Community on Locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live-streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that, and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there, and I'll see you there.